Uh, given that Silent Subjects is in the title of this book, I guess I was at some risk of being one myself, but now that I'm zoomed in, um, I'd like to welcome you to this um, brief panel discussion uh, with Georgia Frank about her new book, Unfinished Christians, Ritual Objects and Silent Subjects in Late Antiquity, um, a book which I think um, in um, a small space makes um, a very big argument um, and has beautiful illustrations. It offers an approach to the religious lives of lay people um, ordinary Christians, as Georgia terms them. Um, and in this book, I think she really builds way beyond earlier models for what we used to call popular religion to think about the mechanisms, um, primarily but not exclusively liturgical mechanisms, um, for forming people as Christian. Um, and uh, she attends to the things people heard uh, in church, either in sermons or in hymns um, or things that they participated in singing while they were in procession. Um, but she also decenters the human in some interesting ways by looking at the objects that Christians became um, especially interested in in late antiquity, um, especially the things carried in processions. And this becomes a kind of cipher for reading the formation of Christians through their devotion. Um, it's truly elegantly written. It's clear, direct, Crisp. It's a real pleasure um, compared to a lot of academic books. I think Georgia's really kind of hit the nail on the head about how to communicate, not just to people in um, the academic world, but um, perhaps even beyond it, to think a little bit about how liturgy and religious participation makes people. Um, part of what's interesting to me about this book is the way in which um, Georgia is able to get at um, common activities um, and kind of reread them. Um, so there's a wonderful chapter on processions where people are marching along with objects through streets of cities, usually Constantinople or Jerusalem. Um, there's a chapter that I especially love on baptism where Georgia rereads sermons that were preached over people preparing for baptism um, that are full of working class metaphors of casting metal, throwing pots, um, burnishing um, objects um, where the people themselves are objectified um, and baptism kind of makes them the way workshops make things. And I think that this is, is really exciting and kind of gives um, Georgia some real purchase on, on the formation of Christian subjects. Um, I think um, that uh, one of the things that's kind of interesting um, about where this is fitting into current scholarly debate is that Georgia is really up on um, sense uh, discussions about the senses and a sensorium. Um, and it's also pretty clear that she's been reading and thinking a lot with the folks that have been working on emotion and affect. And um, in some ways, without um, kind of much uh, reference, except in deep in the notes to, to theories of sensoria and theories of, um, of emotions. Um, she's able to kind of push religious studies toward a really new way of thinking about lived religion in late antiquity. So um, uh, having sort of said that as by way of introduction, um, I'd like to turn this over to Georgia so she can talk a little bit about what she's done in the book. Thanks so much, Derek. And um, thanks, Petros, for having me uh, and Derek to talk about this uh, project. Um, Petros, if it's if you are able to share the PowerPoint, that would be great. But if you can't, I can uh, talk through this. All right, thank you. Um, we're going to do this like a um, 20th century art history lecture, where I'm going to ask Petros to change the slides because somehow my Zoom uh, screen <laughs> shares not. So um, the cover object of, of is is the starting point. Great, unfinished Christians. I'm gonna what I'm going to do in the few minutes I have right now is um, is just go through these uh, some key words in my title to unpack them a little bit. And because it's not an illustrated book, I'm gonna provide some illustrations um, that uh, really fostered my own thinking about this. Um, next slide, please. Um, my, my subject is really about um, the idea that um, ordinary people seem to have been lost to us and um, much in the way that uh, recent historians have been thinking about how the lives of enslaved peoples have been lost. And so how do we imagine our ways back into um, an archive that is very sparse 
and often very hostile to these um, subjects. And so I've been really inspired by the work of Saidia Hartman and also um, Marissa Fuentes. Next slide, please. I think about objects like um, slave, uh, the, the slave collar, things people wore. Next slide, please. Um, the amulets that people wore. So a lot of the words we study were often carried on bodies um, of, of these silent subjects. Next slide, please. Um, and even in um, this token um, from the shrine for um, Simeon, the, um, Simeon Stylite, you can see the handprint of the manufacturer on the back. That I box that it, you can actually see the fingerprints and handprints that crafted this object. So craft is a really important um, notion in this book. How do we make um, Christians in an age in the fourth to fifth and sixth century of mass conversion? Next slide, please. Um, I think also about um, the spaces in which they were. So this is actually um, from a workshop of mass production of lamps. Um, in Israel, I'm really interested in also how were these spaces illuminated? Um, how might uh, ritual um, that took place in the dark um, or in a very darkened space, um, how might that inflect the, the things that are being sung in a night vigil, say? So I have a chapter on night vigils. Next slide, please. Um, oh, sorry, uh, can we go back? Wrong one. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not going to go too much into baptism. I'll just leave leave this slide here. Um, and um, if it's okay, Petros, can you turn off the slideshow, please? Um, and I'll go back to full camera. Thank you. Um, so, what I'm what I'm going to what I'm talking about is really how can we know this? And I focus a lot on lived religion. Lived religion has two dimensions, and it's they're very important. Um, it's an important diptych. There is lived religion in the ancient world, a project out of the University of Erfurt and many universities through a European Council funding. Um, there's also lived religion through sensorium and other books on the senses and antiquity. And, but I also wanted to think about lived religion with unnamed people and, and the idea of collective lived religion. And for that, I found much more helpful models in American sociologists of religion, like somebody called Nancy Tatum Ammerman, um, also Robert Orsi. You don't need to remember all these names, but it's less about an individual going against conventions as it might be in some lived religion projects of, the, of antiquity, but how can we know the lives of people outside institutions and as embodied religion? The American um, lived religion model is ethnographic. They can interview their subjects. I couldn't, uh, but they also are really helping me think about embodied ways. The, um, the unfinished Christians, I think, is really um, something that comes out for me after how I got in, after a year of um, at Cornell University at the Society for the Humanities. It was a themed um, research project, and my the theme that year was fabrication. So I got to work with choreographers, textile designers, um, literary scholars, all thinking about different ways of fabrication. And that got me really paying attention to the fabrication language that is in baptismal sermons in an era of mass conversion. So John Chrysostom figures largely in this text as I think about how he describes um, baptism in language of smelting, of melting, of um, extraction of pure substances, and but also that these objects that, that craftspeople make are also very fragile. And so there's a language of vulnerability and a need for repair and need for restoration. So I thought about all these metaphors in the context of um, um, early Byzantine cities, which were had crafts, had workshops attached to homes and embedded in urban centers. So to really think about what it is, what it is like to be among people who are makers, and to be also in an environment where there's constant making going on. So I looked at, as Derek mentioned, I looked at workshops, um, what we can know about the archaeology of workshop workshops and a corollary to that is the archaeology of apprenticeship. Apprentices are learners. They learn how to work with materials 
and adjust materials. They learn how, when materials break, how to repair them or start over. And all that language um, is really in these sermons, a deep familiarity. So I looked at papyri of apprentice contracts. I looked at fabrication marks. We can see um, there's a site called The Art of Making. Um, and it shows, you can find um, a, a um, a sculptural piece with um, two left feet. And as if, you know, that somebody was learning how to make feet in the corner of that workshop, it wasn't, you know, these practice pieces were left behind so archeologists could find them. They weren't as um, workshops moved around. And so I, I got really interested in the individual hand and the kind of kinship that, cre that happens in the process of workshop um, cultures. I found all those metaphors, I, I talk a lot about how those metaphors map onto ways of thinking about oneself as Christian. That's the chapter that really got me thinking that Christian identity is hardly fixed in the fourth and fifth and sixth century. Ordinary Christians are not um, defective Christians, they are Christians in the making. They are learning um, how to work with the materials they have and how to uh, sustain and restore them. Um, a, a brief word um, just about the other chapters, street processions. I was really interested in how much uh, street processions by non-Christians were about carrying things through streets and seeing objects moving through streets. So I paid closer attention to descriptions of how things move through streets as, as people. And this was usually through festival sermons. I also got very interested in um, how, how, um, how emotions have a materiality. So there's a chapter on feast day sermons and mixed emotions. For that, I also drew on lectionaries and paying careful attention to the antiphons. How do these antiphons being a, a, a short line from a psalm, how does the antiphon shape the emotion or the mood of a certain festival? And I, cert and I found that um, in the course of a liturgic, liturgical year, one festival might evoke the emotion of another festival. So this might be obvious to a lot of folks, but to me, it was really interesting to see how um, on a day of joy, like the nativity, sadness at the anticipation of the, of the, of the crucifixion might enter into, um, uh, into these sermons, um, how the horror of the massacre of the innocents might be kind of a roller coaster rhetoric, as Byron McDougal put it, um, for thinking about um, joy and horror on the day of the nativity. Um, as, as many might know, I've been very interested in a sixth century hymnographer called Romanos the Melodist, and especially in the performative dimensions um, of his songs in which ordinary people sang along with the refrain. I'm, um, that, I, that's what I'm wagering here. And their participation in these um, expansions of the biblical stories got me thinking about, especially the ones in, uh, stories that are set at night. So what is it like to sing along with the story of the beheading of John the Baptist at night when all the action in the story takes place at night? How do the shadows look to you? How do the reflections look to you? How do lamps shape this, these spaces? Um, so that's really just the overview to think that this is um, um, an approximation um, and some speculation, but to get us to the lives of people who are not entirely lost to the historical record and using the sources of people who didn't always take them very seriously, but in whose presence they listened carefully and sang along. Thank you.